Good morrow, scholars. Welcome back to Star Wars, uh, Episode 5, The Empire Strikes Back. We are in Chapter 2, page 272. I said Chapter 2, right? Yeah. The temperature, the temperature on the surface of Hoth had dropped, but despite the frigid air, the Imperial um, probe droid continued its leisurely drift above the snow-swept fields and hills, its extended sensors still reaching in all directions for signs of life. The robot's heat sensor suddenly reacted. It had found a heat source in the vicinity, and warmth was a good indication of life. The head swiveled on its axis, the sensitive eye-like blisters noting the direction from which the heat source originated. Automatically, the probe droid adjusted its speed and began to move at a maximum velocity over the icy fields. The insect-like machine slowly uh, slowed only when it uh, neared a mound of snow bigger than the probe droid itself. The robot scanners made note of the mound size, nearly 1.8 meters in height and an enormous 6 meters long, but the mound size was of only secondary importance. What, tru what was truly astounding, if a surveillance machine could ever be astounded, was the amount of heat radiating from, uh, from beneath the mound. The creature under that snowy hill must surely be well protected against the cold. A thin blue-white beam of light shot from one of the probe robots appendages, its intense heat boring into the white mound and scattering gleaming snow uh, flecks in all directions. The mound began to shiver, then to quake. Whatever existed beneath it was deeply irritated by the robot's uh, probing laser beam. Snow began to fall away from the mound and sizable clumps went at one end. Two eyes showed through the mass of white. Huge yellow eyes peered like twin points of fire at the mechanical creature that continued to blast away with its painful beams. The eyes burned with a primeval hatred for the thing that had interrupted its slumber. The mound shook again with a roar that was nearly destroyed. That nearly destroyed the probe droid's auditory sensors. It zoomed back several meters, widening the space between it and the creature. The droid had never before encountered a wampa ice creature. Its computers advised that the beast be dealt with um, expeditiously. The droid made an internal adjustment to regulate the potency of its laser beam. Less than a moment later, the beam was at maximum intensity. The machine aimed, at the, uh, aimed the laser at the creature, enveloping it in a great flaming and smoking cloud. Seconds later, the few remaining particles of the wampa, oh that's sad were swept away by the icy winds. The smoke disappeared, leaving behind no physical evidence, save for a large depression in the snow, that an ice creature had ever been there. But its existence had been properly, reco uh, properly recorded in the memory of the probe droid, which was already continuing on its programmed mission. The roars of another Wampa ice creature finally awakened the battered young rebel commander. Luke's head was spinning, aching, perhaps exploding for all he could tell. With painstaking effort, he brought his vision into focus, discerning that he was in an ice gorge, its jagged walls uh, reflecting the fading twilight. Just when I thought I had escaped. He suddenly realized he was hanging upside down, arms dangling and fingertips some 30 centimeters away from the snowy floor. His ankles uh, were numb. He craned his neck and saw that his feet were frozen in ice hanging from the ceiling and that the ice was forming on his legs like stalactites. He could feel the frozen mask of his own blood caked on his face where the wampa ice creature had viciously slashed him. Again Luke heard the bestial moans, louder now as they resounded through the deep and narrow passageway of ice. The roars of the monster were deafening. He wondered which would kill him first, the cold or the fangs and claws of the thing that inhabited the gorge. I've got to free myself, he thought, get free of this ice. His strength had not yet returned fully, but with a determined effort he pulled himself up and reached for the confining bonds. Still too weak, Luke could not break the ice and fell back into his hanging position while the white floor uh, rushed up at him. Relax, he said to himself, relax. The ice walls creaked with the ever louder bellows of the approaching creature. His feet crunched on the frigid floor, uh, floor uh, coming frighteningly nearer. It would not be long before the shaggy white horror would be back and possibly warming the cold young warrior in the darkness of its belly. That's a gruesome thought. Luke's eyes darted around the gorge, finally spotting the pile of gear he had brought with him on his mission. Now lying in a useless crumpled heap on the floor, the equipment was nearly 
a full unattainable meter beyond his grasp, and with that gear was a device that entirely captured his attention. A stout hand grip with a pair of small switches and surmounting metal disc. The object had once belonged to his father, a former Jedi Knight who had been betrayed by and murdered by a young Darth Vader, but now it was Luke's given to him by Ben Kenobi to be wielded with honor against Imperial tyranny. In desperation, Luke tried twisting his aching body just enough to reach the discarded lightsaber. But the freezing cold coursing through his body slowed him down and weakened him. Luke was beginning to resign himself to his fate as he heard the snarling wampa ice creature approaching. His last feelings of hope were nearly gone when he sensed the presence. But it was not the presence of the white giant that dominated this gorge. Rather, it was that soothing spiritual presence which occasionally visited Luke in moments of stress or danger. The presence that he uh, had first come to him only after old Ben once again in his Jedi role of Obi-Wan Kenobi vanished into a crumple of his own dark robes after being cut down by Darth Vader's lightsaber. The presence that was sometimes like a familiar voice, an almost silent whisper that spoke directly into Luke's mind. Luke, uh, the whisper was there again, hauntingly. Think of the lightsaber in your hand. The words made Luke's already aching head throb. Then he felt a sudden resurgence of strength, a feeling of confidence that urged him to continue fighting despite his apparently hopeless situation. His eyes fixed upon the lightsaber. His hand reached out painfully, the freezing in his limbs already taking its toll. He squeezed his eyes shut in concentration, but the weapon was still beyond his reach. He knew that the lightsaber would require more than just struggling to reach. Gotta relax, Luke told himself. Relax. Luke's my, uh Luke's mind whirled as he heard the words of his disembodied guardian. Let the force flow, Luke. The force! <laughs> Luke saw the inverted gorilla-like image of the wampa ice creature looming, its raised arms ending in enormous gleaming claws. He could see the apish face for the first time now, and shivered at the sight of the beast's ram-like horns, the quivering lower jaw of its, with its protruding fangs. But then the warrior divorced the creature from his thoughts. He stopped struggling for his weapon. His body relaxed and went limp, allowing his spirit to be receptive to his teacher's suggestion. Already he could feel coursing through him that energy field generated by all living things that bound the very universe together. As Kenobi had taught him, the force was within Luke to use as he saw fit. The wampa ice creature spread its black hooked claws and lumbered toward the hanging youth. Suddenly the lightsaber, as if by magic, sprang to Luke's hand. Instantly he depressed a colored button on the weapon, releasing a blade-like beam that quickly severed his icy bonds. As Luke, weapon in hand, dropped to the floor, the monstrous figure towering over him took a cautious step backward. The beast's sulfurous eyes blinked incredulously at the humming light shaft, a sight baffling to its primitive brain. Though it was difficult to move, Luke jumped to his feet and waved the lightsaber at the snow-white mass of muscle and hair. It sounds like Michael. Forcing it back a step, another step. Bringing the weapon down, Luke cut through the monster's hide with the blade of light. The wampa ice creature shrieked, its hideous roar of agony uh, shaking the gorge walls. It turned and hastily, hastily lumbered out of gorge while its white bulk... Uh, was blending with the distant terrain. The sky was already uh, noticeably darker, and with the encroaching darkness came the colder winds. The force was with Luke, but even that mysterious power could not warm him now. Every step he took as he stumbled out of the gorge was more difficult than the last. Finally, his vision dimming as rapidly as the daylight, uh, Luke stumbled down into an embankment of snow and was unconscious before he even reached the bottom. Uh-oh. In the subsurface main hangar uh, dock, Chewie was getting the Millennium Falcon ready for takeoff. He looked up from his work to see a rather curious pair of figures that had just appeared from around a nearby corner to mingle with the usual rebel activity in the hangar. Neither of these figures was human, although one of them had a humanoid shape and gave the impression of a man in knightly golden armor. His movements were precise, almost too precise to be human, as he clanked stiffly through the corridor. His companion required no man-like legs for locomotion, for he was doing quite well rolling uh, his shorter barrel-like body along the miniature wheels. The shorter of the two droids was beeping and whistling excitedly. It is not my fault, you malfunctioning tin can. 
the tall anthropomorphic anthropomorphic sorry droid stated gesturing with a metallic hand I did not ask you to turn on the thermal heater early I merely commented that it was freezing in her chamber but it's supposed to be freezing how are we all going to get her things dried out ah here we are C-3PO the golden droid in human shape paused to focus his optical sensors on the docked Millennium Falcon the other robot R2-D2 retracted his wheels and frontal leg rested his stout metal body on the ground the smaller droid's sensors were reading the familiar figures of Han Solo and his Wookiee companion as those two continued the work of replacing the freighter's central lifters Mr. Solo, sir, 3PO called, the only one of the robotic twosome, equipped with an imitation human voice. Might I have a word with you? Han was not in a particularly good mood to be disturbed, especially with, by this fastidious droid. What is it? Mistress Leia has been trying to reach you on the communicator. 3PO informed him, it must be malfunctioning. But Han knew that it was not. I shut it off, he said sharply as he continued to, continued to work on his ship. What does Her Royal Holiness want now? Three Fios auditory sensors identified the disdain in Han's voice but did not understand it. The robot mimicked a human gesture and added, She is looking for Master Luke and assumed he would be here with you. No one seems to know. Luke's not back yet? Immediately Han became concerned. He could see the sky beyond the ice cavern entrance had grown considerably darker since he and Chewbacca had begun to prepare the Millennium Falcon. Han knew just how severely the temperatures temperatures dropped on the surface after nightfall and how deadly the winds could be in a flash he jumped off the falcon's lift not even looking back toward the wookie bolted down chewy officer of the deck uh han yelled then brought his comlink to his mouth and asked security control has commander skywalker reported in yet a negative reply brought a scowl to han's face the deck sergeant and his aide hurried up to solo in response to his summons is Commander Skywalker back yet? Han asked, attention in his voice. I haven't seen him, the deck sergeant replied. It's possible he came in through the south entrance. Check on it, Solo snapped, though he was not in an official position uh, to give commands. It's urgent. As the deck sergeant and his aide turned and rushed down the corridor, R2 emitted a concerned whistle that rose inquiringly in pitch. I don't know, R2, Repio answered, stiffly turning his upper torso and head in Han's direction. Sir, might I inquire what's going on? Anger welled up inside Han as he grunted back at the robot. Go tell your precious princess that Luke is dead unless he shows up soon. R2 began to whistle hysterically at Solo's grim prediction, and his now frightened golden partner exclaimed, Oh no! The main tunnel was filled with activity when Han Solo rushed in. He saw a pair of rebel troopers employing all their physical strength to restrain a, ter a nervous tauntaun that was trying to break free. From the opposite end, the deck officer rushed into the corridor, his eyes darting around the chamber until he had spotted Han. Sir, he said frantically, uh, Commander Skywalker hasn't come through the south entrance. He might have forgotten to check in. Not likely, Han snapped. Are the speeders ready? Not yet, the deck officer answered. Adapting them to the cold is proving difficult, maybe by morning. Han cut him off. There wasn't any time to waste on machines that could and probably would break down. I'll have to go out in Tauntauns. I'll take Sector 4. The temperature is falling too rapidly. You bet it is, Han growled, and Luke's out in it. The other officer volunteered. I'll cover Sector 12, have controls that, uh, screen Alpha. But Han knew there was no time for control to get its surveillance cameras operating, not with Luke probably dying somewhere on the desolate plains above. He pushed away his way through uh, the assemblage of rebel troops and took the reins of one of the trained Tauntauns leaping onto the creature's back. The night storms will start before any of you can reach the first marker, uh, the deck officer warned. Then I'll see you in hell, grunted Han, tugging the reins of his mount and maneuvering the animal out of the cave. Snow was falling heavily as Han Solo raced his tauntaun through the wilderness. Night was near and the winds were howling fiercely, piercing his heavy clothes. He knew that he would be as useless as an icicle to Luke unless he found the young warrior soon. The tauntaun was already feeling the effects of the temperature drop. Not even its labors, layers of insulating fat or the matted gray fur could protect it from the elements after nightfall. Already the beast was wheezing, its breath becoming increasingly labored. Han sprayed the snow, uh, prayed the snow lizard wouldn't drop, at least not until he had located Luke. He drove his mount harder, forcing it on, uh, on across the icy plains. 
Another figure was moving across the snow, its metal body hovering above the frozen ground. The Imperial probe droid paused briefly in mid-flight, its sensors twitching. Then, satisfied with its findings, the robot gently lowered itself, coming to a rest on the ground. Like spider legs, several probes separated from the metal hull, dislodging some of the snow that had settled there. Something began to take shape around the robot, a pulsating glow that gradually covered the machine as if as if with a transparent dome. Quickly this force field solidified, repelling the blowing snow that brushed over the droid's hull. After a moment, the glow faded and the blowing wind soon formed a perfect dome of white, completely concealing the droid and its protective force field. The Tauntaun was racing at maximum speed, certainly too fast concerning the distance it had traveled in the unbearable, uh, frigid air. No longer wheezing, it had begun moaning pitifully, and its hind legs were becoming more and more unsteady. Han felt sorry about the Tauntaun's pain, but at present the creature's life was only secondary to that of his friend Luke. I'm sad. It was becoming difficult for Han to see through the thickening snowfall. Despite, uh, desperate rather, sorry, he searched for some interruption of the internal, uh, the eternal plains. What is with me today? Some distant spot that might actually be Luke, but there is nothing to see other than the darkening expanses of snow and ice. Yet there was a sound. Han drew the reins in, bringing the Tauntaun to an abrupt halt on the plain. Solo could not be certain, but there seemed to be some sound other than the howling of the winds that whipped past him. He strained to look in the direction of the sound, then he spurred his Tauntaun, forcing it to gallop across the snow-swept field. Luke could have been a corpse, food for the scavengers by the time the light of dawn re returned, but somehow he was still alive, though barely, and struggling to stay that way even with the night storms violently assaulting him. Luke painfully pulled himself up right from the snow, only to be blasted back down by the freezing gale. As he fell, he considered the irony of it all. A farm boy from Tatooine returning to battle the Death Star, now perishing alone in a frozen alien wasteland. It took all of Luke's remaining strength to drag himself a half meter before finally collapsing, sinking into the ever-deepening drifts. I can't, he said, though no one could hear his words. But someone, though still unseen, had heard. You must, Luke, the words vibrated in Luke's mind. Luke, look at me. Luke could not have... Uh, ignored that command. The power of those softly spoken words was too great. With a great effort, Luke lifted his head and saw what he thought was a hallucination. In front of him, apparently unaffected by the cold, and still clad only in the shabby robes he had worn in the hot desert of Tatooine, stood Ben Kenobi. Luke wanted to call out to him, but he was speechless. The apparition spoke with the same gentle authority Ben had always used with the young man. You must survive, Luke. The young commander found the strength to move his lips again. I'm cold. I'm so cold. You must go to the Dagobah system, the spectral figure of Ben Kenobi instructed. You will learn from Yoda, the Jedi Master, the one who taught me. Luke listened, then reached to touch the ghostly figure. Ben. Ben, he groaned. Hi. The figure remained unmoved by Luke's efforts to reach it. Luke, it spoke again. You're our only hope. Our only hope. Luke was confused, yet before he gathered the strength to ask for an explanation, the figure began to fade. And when every trace of the apparition had passed from his sight, Luke thought what he uh, thought he saw the approach of a tauntaun with a human rider on its back. The snow lizard was approaching, its gait unsteady, the rider was still too far away, too obscured by the storm for identification. In desperation, the young rebel commander called out, Ben, uh, before again dropping off into unconsciousness. It feels weird saying my own name. The snow lizard was barely able to stand on its um, sorry and hind legs when Han Solo reined it to a stop and dismounted. Han looked with horror at the snow-covered, almost frozen form lying as if dead at his feet. Come on, buddy. He appealed to Luke's inert figure, immediately forgetting his own nearly frozen body. You aren't dead yet. Give me a signal here. Han could detect no sign of life and noticed that Luke's face, uh, nearly covered with snow, was savagely torn. He rubbed at the youth's face, being careful not to touch uh, the drying wounds. Don't do this, Luke. It's not your time. Finally, a slight response, a low moan, barely, barely audible over the winds, was strong enough to send a warm glow through Han's own shivering body. He grinned with relief. I knew you wouldn't leave me out here all alone. We've got to get you out of here. Knowing that Luke's salvation and his own lay at... Uh, 
In the speed of the tauntaun, Han moved toward the beast carrying the young warrior limply in his arms. But before he could drape the unconscious form over the animal's back, the snow lizard gave it an agonized roar, then fell into a shaggy gray heap on the snow. Laying his companion down, Han rushed to the side of the fallen creature. The tauntaun made one final sound, not a roar or bellow, but only a sickly rasp. Then the beast was silent. Solo gripped the tauntaun's hide, his numbed fingers searching for even the slightest indication of life. Deader than a triton moon. He said, knowing that Luke did not hear a word. We haven't got that much time. Resting Luke's motionless form against the belly of the now dead snow lizard, uh, Han proceeded to work. It might be something of a sacrilege, he mused, using a Jedi's favorite weapon like this, but right now Luke's lightsaber was the most efficient and precise tool to cut through the thick skin of a tauntaun. At first, the weapon felt strange in his hand, but momentarily he was cutting the animal's carcass. Uh, from head to scaly hind paws, Han winced at the foul odor that rose from the steaming incision. There were a few things he could remember that stank like a snow lizard's innards. Without deliberation, he tossed the slippery entrails into the snow. When the animal's corpse had been entirely eviscerated, ew. Han shoved his friend inside the warm, hair-covered skin. I know this doesn't smell so good, Luke, but it'll keep you from freezing. I'm sure this tauntaun wouldn't hesitate if it were the other way around. From the body of the snow lizard, another blast of entrail stench rose out of the disemboweled cavity. Whew! I can almost smell it. Ugh. Han almost gagged. It's just as well you're out cold, pal. There wasn't much time to do what he had to. Uh, what had to be done. Han's freezing hands went to the supply pack strapped to the tauntaun's back and rummaged through the rebel issue items until he located the shelter container. Before unpacking it, he spoke into his comlink. Echo Base, do you copy? No response. This comlink is useless. The sky had darkened ominously, and the winds blew violently, making even breathing close to impossible. Han fought to open the shelter container and stiffly began to construct the one piece of rebel equipment that might protect them both, if only for a short while longer. If I don't get this shelter up fast, he grumbled to himself, Jabba won't need those bounty hunters. Okay, that was chapter two. Yay, he found him. Uh, hmm. I feel like there's really not much to say about this chapter. What do you guys think? I guess you let me know in the comments. Mm. I wonder. What is it, Iggy? I'm going to go ahead and feed him. All right, thanks you guys for watching. Let me know. Um, I'm going to see how many chapters are in Return of the Jedi, and then I'm going to do the math and see what chapter I will end up being on when The Force Awakens comes out. And you guys let me know what chapter you think it will be of what book. And if you're right, you will get a prize for it. Until next time, goodbye everybody.